It is Wednesday afternoon, September 21st. We are picking up right at the very end of chapter 10. We are poised and ready to go into chapter 11. But in that real quick review, because I kind of threw it at you fast in the, the end of the last class, we looked at the fact that through these chapters that we've come through, especially in chapter 10, though, if really all of chapter 10, um, we looked at many nations. We saw that, that this is nations that we're looking back when we read it in 10. It wasn't they'd happened yet because the catalyst to make this happen is chapter 11. But because it's a compilation, they were able to tell us where to give us that genealogy that the where the people traveled because they knew. So they were able to write that in and to look at where the, the nations came from and where they went. We saw 26 nations came out of Shem. We saw 30 nations out of Ham, and we saw 14 nations out of Yafeth. That's Ham, Shem, and Japheth for those who are used to it in English. When we totaled that up, we saw it was 70 nations. And when we saw 70 nations, we took a quick look, and I'm going to take you over there. I don't want to ruin the wrong tab. Okay, I think I've got it backwards here today. Okay, I can straighten that out in a minute, but... Uh, keep keep it in Genesis, but those who want to go over to Deuteronomy 32 with me real quickly, go ahead and go to Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 7 and 8. Where are we going? Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8. God, in his foreknowledge, God knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. He sees it as already done and already completed. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7, he said, remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations, ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, they will tell you, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. And that number we found out when we go back toward Genesis, and we're going to go back on our way back to chapter 10, we are going to go to chapter 46, and we're going to see that there were 70 in relation to the Jewish people. So when God talked about making the nations as the sons of Israel, that's what he is referring to. Genesis 46 and verse 27 says, and the sons of Joseph, Joseph, and that's the son of Jacob, that's um, that's who, you know, Israel comes from, that this line, the sons of Joseph who were born in Egypt were two, all the persons of the house of Jacob who came to Egypt were 70, so Joseph's sons were included in that count, but the count for Israel, the count for Jacob, who represents Israel, was 70, so when God sang in this verse, that he numbered the nations according to the sons of Israel. Here's our number, and it's 70. So we're looking at the number 70, and we're seeing in Scripture there is a significance to uh, the number 70 in relation to Israel. Again, we have 70 children of Israel that went down into Egypt from Canaan. Um, that was when Joseph had been raised up and was in a position that he could bring his whole family into Egypt to escape the famine and to survive. It's many, um, it's over 400 years later when the children of Israel return, when they come out of slavery, that's when we have Pesach, Passover, that's Exodus, you know, chapter 12 and, and so forth. But they went down just 70. That's a small number. There are families that have more than 70 in their clan today and that was the whole nation of Israel at this point so they were a very small number but God and the small are a majority I'll put it that way now how else do we see the number is 70 associated with Israel we saw and again this is review so I won't do quite as much detail but I still want to give us um the overall and I, okay I'm just gonna have to work with my tablet backwards um, I want to get our, you know, since we hurried through it, I want to make sure we caught everything I wanted. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27 is one of the biggest prophetic um, scriptures that we have. It covers all the way from um, Nebuchadnezzar's time, really, all the way through to Messiah's second coming. It covers the first coming, the second coming of Yeshua. It's... Um, 
it's one of the biggest prophecies we have. Book of Revelation relates to it, et cetera, et cetera. But we're only looking at, at our point for 70 right now. I'm not here to teach on the 70 weeks. I have done that. It probably is up on the bit.ly side. If it's not and you're interested, just let me know. But uh, what we are seeing here is right at the very start, verse 24. And it says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and for your holy city. And then it tells what's to happen in those 70 weeks as we go on with the prophecy. Why do I bring this out now? Because when it's saying in the book of Daniel, when it says your people, it's talking Daniel. Who are Daniel's people? Is that everybody? No, it's those who are related to him. He's living in Babylon. He, he was taken there in captivity when he was about 16 years old. So is it talking about the Babylonian people? No, he kept himself separate from them right from the very beginning. Anytime you see in scripture, in I'm sorry, in Daniel, particular in Daniel, when he's talking to Daniel, he's talking to your people. He's talking to those physically connected to Daniel is the Jewish nation, is the Jewish people. When he says your holy city, I think everybody knows the holy city is the city God put his name on in relation to the Jewish people. We're talking Jerusalem. We're not talking somewhere in Utah. We're not talking anywhere else on the face of this earth. We're not talking Mecca. We're, we're talking according to what God has said for his Jewish people, Daniel's people, and for Jerusalem. So very specifically, this 70 weeks is determined in relation to and for Israel and the Jewish people. Now, when you break it down in the Hebrew, the way the Hebrew says it's 70 sevens. 70 periods of seven years is what we find out when we study it. So we see 70 very uh, prevalent in that. And I encourage people, stay on track with that and realize this is not speaking to the church, that the church is a called out assembly that has not even started in Daniel's day. Daniel's day, we're like 500 BC. The church isn't going to start till we're, we're 40 plus AD. So we're, you've got to realize God has, he, he is multiple. How do I say it? He not personally, he's a triune God What in what? But he has multiple plans. He has multiple things going on. He's not so narrow that he can't do but one thing. So he has his nation of Israel that he's working through. He knows what they're going to do. He knows he's going to set them aside with their plan and raise up the called out assembly in time, work through them to provoke Israel to jealousy, to bring Israel back into that right relationship with him and so forth and so on. God's got more people than just one person or just one nation. Israel are his people. He makes that clear. He calls them his people even when they're rebellious. It's just like in our natural, a parent may have a rebellious child, but that child is still their child. God also has called out a people. He calls them his people and they're the called out assembly. They're the church today. So the, you have to know your context to know who he's talking about. In the book of Daniel, the church isn't even there yet. He's talking about Israel and the Jewish nation. And if you keep that in your mind and you keep the scriptures to whom they are to, you'll know who God is speaking to. Can we learn lessons from each other? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we need to experience and do everything for ourselves or can we look around us and learn from others? You know we can learn from others. And sometimes it's great wisdom to learn from others and not follow in their footsteps other times it's good to follow but uh, again i'm just trying to make it very clear that god has a wonderful plan for israel and he will complete it fully he has a wonderful plan for his called out assembly that you like to call the church he will complete it fully the two are not against each other one does not replace the other god has room in his house and it is a wonderful majestic plan hallelujah what a god don't Dummy him down. He's got a huge mind. We can't attain. Okay, on track. Israel was led by 70 elders. We can see the number 70. Let's go real quickly to Numbers, Bed Midbar, Numbers chapter 11, and we will see that. Numbers chapter 11. 
and we will start with verse 16 and 17, and then we'll jump down and read verse 25. 16 and 17 of Numbers chapter 11 says, The Lord therefore said to Moshe, to Moses, Gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of the meeting. Bring them to what becomes called the tabernacle. Let them take their stand there with you. This is where God would meet with Moshe. Give him instruction for the children of Israel. Now he's telling Moshe at this point, right now, gather 70 elders, 70 men who are of wisdom, 70 who you know will, will be in accord to meet with me at this point where I'm going to meet with you. There, then verse 17, I will come down, speak with you there. I will take of the spirit who is upon you, Moshe, Moses, um, and will put him upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it alone. It was too much for Moshe to be over all of the children of Israel, be able to take care of every need, every complaint, every judgment. We're talking two and a half million plus. This is not a small group. I, I challenge you to have a camp of 70 and stay on top of every need and take care of every, you know, I can't imagine with that many people, but that's why God was providing for him. But notice that they were going to be empowered by the Spirit of God. It wasn't that they were going to be going in their own wisdom. The Spirit of God would direct them. But did you notice Moshe is told to take 70? Later, the council for the Jewish people in judgment is called the Sanhedrin. And it's very interesting that it has 70 members. It's highly believed that they patterned it off of the 70 elders, that this is where they went from. Then we find that there were 70 scholars who translated what you call the Old Testament. I like to call it the original covenant so you don't get the idea it's old and antiquated because it's not. But the, the original scriptures, the, the um, well, in your Bible from Genesis to Malachi, in the Jewish Bible is Genesis through the Chronicles, but it's all the same books. They're just in a different order. And it was 70 scholars who translated it from Hebrew into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. It was because Greek was becoming the, the language of the world at that time. And they needed it into a language that more could understand. Only the Jewish people knew Hebrew. But it's interesting, it was 70 scholars. Then when you look at what Moshe said for man in chapter 90 and verse 10 of Psalm, he is telling us that man is given 70 years to live. I'll read that for you real quickly. Uh, Psalm chapter 90 and verse 10. It doesn't mean that you die at 70. It even addresses that. It says in verse 10, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. That's what's been meted out for man. Or if due to strength, 80 years. And then it goes on. So man should have at least 70 and some are going to be strong enough. They're going to live even to 80 years. Now, again, we see people live beyond that, but it's just, uh, they say it was given unto man to live 70 years. That's the way they look at it. A number connected to the Jewish way of thinking. The Babylonian captivity that I mentioned a few moments ago that Daniel, Daniel was involved in 70 years. Herod's temple, that's the second temple. You've got Shlomo Solomon's, the first one is destroyed um, in Babylonian captivity. Then you have, and yeah, yeah, it, basically then. Then you had come down to the temple that was standing when Yeshua Jesus walked on this earth. And that one's known as Herod's temple because Herod was in control at that time. And he did a lot to refurbish it. Uh, it was destroyed by the Romans. It happened to be destroyed about 70 years after Herod tried to destroy baby Yeshua Jesus, when he tried to have all the, the male babies put to death because he wanted to stop the king of Israel who had been born from living. And it's interesting, it was about 70 years later in 70 AD that the temple was destroyed. That's a time critical in Jewish thinking. They look back to it to this day. The fact that the Jewish people were scattered from Jerusalem, from Israel at that time, it gets worse. They're finally totally being pushed out. 
but that great start then, or that horrible start, I should call it, 70 AD. We call it the diaspora, the Jewish people that are living outside of Israel to this day. It's because we're still in the diaspora. We're still in the scattering of our people that happened. Really, the main thrust of it happened in 70 AD. And then very last, the one that I think is very interesting in relation to um, our world and this, what this, oops, I put in Luke 70 because 70 is on my brain. We're going to go to Luke, come on tablet. We're going to go to Luke, but we're going to Luke chapter 10, not uh, 70. You won't find chapter 70 <laughs> in your Bible. If you do get another Bible, because you don't have a good one. Uh, but uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse one, we have, and this is when Yeshua is on this earth, and it says, now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others. He sent them in pairs ahead of him into every city and place where he himself was going to come. So Yeshua sent out the 70. You'll hear that told, that expression given that way. And what he did was he sent them ahead, kind of like what John the Baptist was doing for him, preparing the way for him to come and the people to hear and receive the gospel truth. Now, why do I find that so interesting? He sent out 70. There were 70 nations. Is this the Lord's way of saying, in essence, when we read for the depth of the scripture, that Yeshua was intending for all the nations of the world to receive his gospel message? to receive him. And I fully believe that is what the Lord was intending to do in that 70, sending out of the 70 was saying, for God so loved the world. The gospel was not just to the Jew. And even after Yeshua's time on earth and he's resurrected and he's raising up his, uh, his what's called the church now to carry the gospel message out, we see even in that, and I just lost my whole train of thought. Oh my goodness, where was I going? I derailed myself. I am so sorry. Um, oh, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> we see that it that Shaul Paul said in Romans 1 about the gospel message that it's the power of God unto salvation to all who would believe, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It wasn't meant to be just Israel. It wasn't meant that only Israel would be saved and the rest of the world would, and I'll say it roughly, but truthfully, that the rest of the world was to go to hell. No, that wasn't the Lord's intent, wasn't God's intent, even before he made the foundations of the earth, he died to save the entire world. So I think through Israel, who was supposed to be his first to take the gospel message to the nations, we're seeing that in the number 70. So we find Number 70, very significant in scripture, and I find it very interesting in relation to Israel. So I, I hope that enlightens you and you appreciate it. And uh, um, what else can I say? We're ready for chapter 11. <laughs> okay, so we're back in Bereshit. We are actually moving along. We've got our nations now. But please remember, when we go into chapter 11, they have not gone out and spread out and filled the face of the earth yet. That's what they're going to do. But in verse one of chapter 11, we're seeing that they're not there yet. Okay, so we know that we're told where they're going to go, what's going to happen, but this is going to tell us why it happened. <clears throat> this will tell us what leads God to abandon his dealings with the nations, to single out one person. He's going to start with Avram, and he's going to make Avram the father of his chosen people, Israel, and he's going to work through Israel. But up until this point, he has not singled out one person that way. He's worked with the nation, so there's going to be a change. Now, if you read verses 1 through 9, and you can do that, we'll do it you know, as we're going, but if you read verses 1 through 9, and then you glance back at chapter 10, you'll see verses 8 through 12 in chapter 10 fit with verses 1 through 9. Okay, so we're going to talk about Nimrod City. Let me introduce you again. I should have kept you there for a moment. I have to go back in my tablet. Uh, okay, come on. To chapter 10 and verse 8, just to make it a little more clear. What I'm saying is in 10 verse 8, 
It tells us Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. We see in verse 10, the beginning of Nimrod's kingdom was Babel and some other names that are there in the land of Shinar. Okay, if I go all the way through verse 12, you've got some more names there. This period of verses 8 through 12 in chapter 10 fit in with verses 1 through 9 that we're going to read in just a moment in chapter 11. So chapter 10 and verse 10 tells us Babel is Nimrod's. Chapter 11 and verse 9, sneak down there for just a moment, then we'll go right back up to verse 1, it says, therefore, its name was called Babel. So when we're talking about Babel in Genesis 10.10, 10, it's the same Babel as 11 verse 9. Hope I made that clear. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to make it clear, and hopefully I did. Uh, so with that in mind, we go back now and we'll read verses. Well, we'll start with verse 1 and just go on. Excuse me. So now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. Okay, we've got to close our mind off to the fact that we can walk out our door and see multi ethnic, hear multi ethnic. It wasn't that way. Everybody used the same language. Yes. Okay. I thought I had confusion. All right. In Hebrew, the way you could even say it is that they all had one lip, that they all spoke the same. Uh, it meant their speech was the same. That's why it says their lip. You know, it, it is um, the words the same, the set of words the same, the vocabulary the same. They all were speaking one language. Now, I sent out a text and I said, what was the original language? Do we know? Well, I'm going to give you a thought, which I think could be right on target. So I think we can know, but there isn't a scripture and verse that says, this same language that they used was and fills in the blank for us. But whatever this language was, it's the language that's been spoken since Adam's time. Adam, we've got to go all the way back. We're, we're never told until chapter 11 that there's multi-languages and that people could not understand each other. Up until now, everybody's spoken the same language. So Adam would be understood by Noah. Noah would be understood by his kid, well, his kids, of course, but by Nimrod, you know, as we pass through time, it's all the same. Probably, and you're all going to think, oh, she's prejudiced. Well, hear me why I've got a reason. Probably the language was Hebrew. There's a couple of reasons why we think that. One, the names of people in the scriptures and the names of places prior to Babel. Prior to the, the time when Babel happens, they have meanings in the Hebrew language. I've been giving you meanings as we've, as we've been going along. There's related to Hebrew. There's other languages that are very close. There's little linguistic differences. But again, when we get, like I may say later, oh, in Aramaic, this means, or in Syrian, this means, but those were all the languages that are very closely related that they believe came off of one root. They believe that that root, the original root, was Hebrew. Now, why do we still say Hebrew? We know Aramaic was ancient Hebrew in essence. It was a form that came down into Hebrew. But what are we saying? It's unlikely that Shem, the godly line, and Shem in particular, it's unlikely that Shem was participating in Babel. He, we see God use his line to bring the Messiah through his line. We see it a godly line the same way we saw Seth was godly and Cain was not. Okay, so Babel is going to be very ungodly. Everything that they do is very much against what God told them to do. It leads up to Babel rebellion against God. So when God judges Babel, and I'll explain why he judges with language as we get there. But when he judges Babel and he affects their language so that there is this confusion of tongues, if Shem was not a part of it, then it's very likely that Shem's language was not changed. The others were changed. Shem has been passing down to us what we have recorded in Genesis. Before Shem, we saw that Adam we believe wrote 
that Moshe took what was written, what had been handed down, and he wove it together. And every one of these wrote by the power of the Spirit of God, so that it was truth only that was recorded. But what did Shem speak that was being recorded was Hebrew. That's why the names have meaning in Hebrew, why we can determine different things. It shows it in Hebrew, where by the time you have the name in another language, it doesn't it some doesn't have any meaning and others it's a meaning that doesn't relate it doesn't make sense so it's very likely that Shem and his family continued speaking the same language they had been and the others who were being judged by God for their ungodly acts were the ones that the judgment fell on their languages and their languages were changed and now they're going going to go out with their different languages and not um associate with the Jewish people. We do know that the original um, manuscripts we have of our scriptures are written in Hebrew. So for them to write in Hebrew, they had a spoken Hebrew. You, you can't really write in a language you don't speak, you know, not without learning it. So everything points to the fact that probably Hebrew was the original and it could have been something more like our make Aramaic, but it was what's considered Hebrew today, not not um, not conversational Hebrew, but there is a biblical Hebrew, a Hebrew that relates to the Bible, and this is probably what was spoken. I cannot say it dogmatically. You're free to say free to say, well, I don't think so. I want to believe that you know it was a different language. Find me some proof for it. I'll listen to your argument. But right now, the scriptures being in Hebrew, the names having meaning in Hebrew, the fact that Shem's line is a line that's going to continue down to the Messiah, and it's his records that have been kept, and they've been kept all along in Hebrew, I think Hebrew probably was the original language. Some of you may be thinking, well, what about the future? What language are we going to speak in heaven? Because we know we're not going to babble in heaven. We know there's not going to be confusion. What are we going to speak in heaven? And again, I will tell you, scripture never spells out and says, thou shalt speak Hebrew in heaven. But when Yeshua spoke out of heaven to Shaol Paul, Shaol Paul knew, well, Shaol at the time only, Saul only, he wasn't Paul yet. He knew Greek, he knew Hebrew, very likely he knew more than that. God could have spoken to him in any language, but God out of heaven spoke to him in Hebrew. Just a thought. I see a continuity that carried on. Does it matter? No, <laughs> but I like the sound of it. So anyway, <laughs> um, just a thought, just, you know, things to be thinking about. But uh, whatever the original language was, everything else is going to come off different from it. But you've got an original that I believe God kept from the beginning because the scriptures were already being recorded in that language. And so it just makes sense to me, it was carried on down. So we've got one language, the same words, verse two, it came about as they journeyed east, or you might have from the east. Remember when we saw the movement from the east before? You might not remember, it's a little ways back. Go way back in your memory with me because we move slowly. Go all the way back to Genesis 3, because this is where we have to go back to see that kind of um, direction that was given before. Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 3, and that's a big hint if you know what chapter 3 has to do with. Verse 24 tells us, so he, God, Elohim, drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherry beam, the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So he thrust Adam and Eve out of the garden in the east, pushed them out toward the east. We talked about that at that time. We see the return of the glory of the Lord to the temple during the millennial time, the, the temple that the Lord's glory is going to fill, that he comes from the east, he comes through the eastern gate, and he comes into his temple and fills it all with his presence. We saw many other reasons in scripture that time that moving from the east was in essence moving away from God's, you know, his plan. So we're seeing it in that way. Chapter four and verse 16 on our way back to chapter 11 also backs this up. Chapter four, 
verse 16 of Genesis, where we read, <clears throat> Then Cain, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, and we all know Cain went out because he was rebellious from the Lord, and he went out to do his own thing. He was marked so no one could kill him, but he was not, he never got it right before the Lord as far as we know in scripture. We don't see him with a penitent heart. We don't see him make himself right before God. And notice again, he went out east of Eden. So when we keep that in mind and we go back to chapter 11, we find that they're journeying east. It could be giving us a commentary on their spiritual condition because we've read ahead and we know they're spiritually going to be turning away from God and from what God has commanded of them. So it could be that, that this was to give us that indication. They're moving away from God, from what God has desired of them and for them. Uh, as they journeyed east, they found a plain, P-L-A-I-N, an open plain, a level valley in the land of Shinar. That's the same place that chapter 10, verse 10 told us was Nimrod's Babel. So Babel was in the land of Shinar or Shinar, if you want to call it that. Nimrod was like their king. Remember, he was like a tyrant ruler, like a king there. OK, so now we've got people that are moving there and they settled there or they dwelt there. The Hebrew makes it clear they settled down in this valley. Now, what are they going to do in that valley? They said, verse three, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. OK, come or the Hebrew says go to. The idea is to give, to set, to a place, to choose. Come on now, let's do this here. Let's let's make this happen here is the idea. It's um, in the Hebrew, it's a strong, like there is a division here. We're going to stop. We're going to settle here. We're going to make this happen. It, it's an intent, intent of purpose. How's that? Okay, so they've got a real purpose now. They're going to come together in this east, which may be indicating away from God. And it says, let us make bricks. They literally developed a brick making industry, probably because in this valley, there was not a lot of stone. There wasn't a lot of timber. They need to build with something because we're going to see that they're going to build. And if you don't have stone available and you don't have lumber available, but you have a lot of brick that you can make, mud that they can turn into bricks, and we're going to find out they, they knew how to do that, then they've got something they can build with. And notice it says, come let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. That's heat treatment. They had something equal to what we call a kiln today that would literally bake the, the mud. And in doing that, it would make the brick as hard as stone so that it wouldn't just you know, disintegrate easily. Archaeology has uncovered for us a type of kiln-fired brick and asphalt construction. And the asphalt is not cement like us today, but it was sand and, and other elements that were, you know, in the, in the, in the, whatever I call it, in that, boy, where's the vocabulary when you need it? Um, the elements of the earth that they were using with the mud they could make it strong like our concrete, okay? That was common in ancient Babylon, according to archeology, span that they have actually found remnants of these kilns that were able to make these bricks. Mm -hmm. Now, they took the bricks and they went further than just making those bricks. It said they used the brick for stone. They used tar for mortar. And we've heard about tar before. Does anybody remember where? Very carpet. <laughs> In, in the ark. Thank you, Dora. And no, Roger, it was not La Brea Tarkin. <laughs> but Dora got it right. It was what Noah used to put on the ark. It was called pitch, but we saw that pitch was tar. This is the same word. Some call it slime. You may have slime in your, your translation, but it was a bitumen, B-I-T-U-M-A-N, a bitumen asphalt-like substance. It was tar-like. There were asphalt pits, even though they weren't La Brea's. <laughs> and they're known to have been in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. They've discovered those also. So it probably was very much the same type of material 
And not only did it make Noah's Ark, not only is it going to make these bricks here, but a little later, that's that same word that's used for what Moisha's Ema, Mo Moses's mama, made his basket with that was waterproof. Okay, so it is. It's all the same material. So they took their stone brick, their bricks, let me call them bricks, but they've made them hard like stone, and they took this tar sticky stuff, they were able to begin to build. There was, you know, a, a early form of what we do when we make cement walls and so forth today. Okay, so they said, wow, look at what we can do. Come, let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay, well, if you just read that one verse, you could say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, let's see what's wrong with that. Go back with me for just a moment to chapter nine. I believe it's verse one of Bereshit of Genesis. Yes, it is all in verse one. God blessed Noah and his sons. This is after the ark incident, the flood. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Did he tell the people, stay in one place, all hold it together, make one city, make yourselves a great name, make this power that's, that we're going to talk about reaches to heaven? No, he told them, go out, fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply. Remember, he told Adam they were to be fruitful and multiply. He told Noah the same thing. So. Here we have a direct order in their minds against what God said. I don't want to be scattered. I don't want to go out. I want us all, let's all stay together. Let's all, you know, build something together. <laughs> now, Josephus, who is a Roman, uh, who is Jewish commentator for the Roman people, um, about 100 AD in that, in that time era in there, he said in his book, and I have no way of proving how he said it, but he said a multitude followed Nimrod in building Babel. So the instigator of this, according to Josephus, is Nimrod. We know he, they are in Nimrod's territory. We know Nimrod was acting like a king and like a tyrant. So it makes very good sense that it was being headed by Nimrod. Um, as far as it being a multitude, it must have been a lot of people because we're going to see God has issue with it. It must have been that, that the majority of the people, again, I do not believe Shem and his line would have been following this, but the majority of the people apparently on the face of the earth were all in this accord. So they want to build for themselves a city and a tower, a stronghold is a good word for a tower whose top will reach into heaven. Now, it's interesting to note one more thing about this tower. When they took these bricks and they, they did them in the kiln, they heated them and all, it served to make it with that pitch, with that tar, it served to make them pretty much waterproof. Now, not only are they disobedient to God's command to go out and fill the earth, but apparently they're not believing God's word when he said, I won't destroy with a flood. They didn't want to just build, they wanted to build waterproof. I think they had in their mind, we, you know, if, if a flood comes, we want to be preserved. You know, we want to be safe. So they're trying to make a waterproof tower to protect man against a future deluge that God's promise he won't bring to the earth again. And they're being completely disobedient as far as God's command to go out. So we've got people that are definitely in a rebellious state against God. They're not following what God said. When it says that they want to build a top that will reach into heaven, the Hebrew says it's top being in the heavens. It wasn't that the top was heaven, and it wasn't even that they were trying to build like Jack and the Beanstalk and build the tallest tower they could it's doubtful that they would have even thought they could build a tower all the way up into heaven i mean let's be realistic here any of us can look up at the sky and know that was pretty much an impossible act so it's not really saying that and also by the way if they're wanting to build a tower that's going to reach into heaven wouldn't it have been smarter they're in the valley 
go up to the mountain, go as high up the mountain as you can and start your tower there. You've already got a head start. You're using the mountain. You know, that would just make more sense. So it's, it's very, very doubtful that what they were trying to do was build it tall. But they were building a tower that would would reach the heavens that would be up there that would resemble the heavens. And we're going to see that really what we're delving into here is what is known today as astrological worship. Now, I took you through astronomy. I took you through the gospel written in the stars. And I told you how astronomy has nothing to do with astrology. Astrology has nothing to do with astronomy, that they're totally separate. And here again, I want to make it very clear. Keep in mind, now we are talking about astrology. What we see, and they have remnants of what's called a ziggurat, what's called a tower like this. They have remnants where they can prove what we are saying. And that is that they are... Um, replicating the heavens, that they are beginning what we know develops into worshiping the heavens rather than the creator of the heavens. So they're beginning to worship other gods, little g. They're worshiping planets, that, that there's a god of that planet. They're worshiping the sun, they're worshiping the moon, they're worshiping the stars, etc., etc., etc. There was an ancient Greek historian and geographer. His name is Herodotus. It's Herod with O-T-U-S on the end. He lived from 484 BC to either 425 or 413 BC. He lived in that era, okay? He said the Tower of Babel still stood in his day and that he had even seen it. Now, he was the first writer to perform what's called a systematic investigation of historical events, um, but they credit him really with being the very first historian that invented what we call the field of history today, that if you want the father of history, the one who started it and said, this is how you study it, this is how you learn from it, this is the one that they call him, but they call him the father, <laughs> they call him the father of history. Okay, so he's the one that we're getting some of this information from it goes as far back as we can go. Now we know we get history from the Bible, but I'm talking outside of the Bible. This is the, the oldest we can find. And again, he says that astrological and occult practices in history were proven to go all the way back to the time of Babel. So he is only emphasizing what we read in the Bible. He's giving credibility to it from an outside source. That's one of the things that you do when you look at whether the Bible is authoritative and inherent is you look at it from the internal evidence and you look at it from external evidence and everything proves that Bible to be 100% the word of God. So believing that, that we're understanding it correctly, they've built really a top who, that's a representation of the heavens and they, this system will be formalized in what's called the Zodiac. It's um, found on the ornate ceilings and walls of other temples. It seemed to be a common, a common, um, uh, the different nations in antiquity all seem to delve into this as we look at the ancient nations that we can find. It was a worship called the host of the heavens. And in that, they would be worshiping the fallen angels. They would be worshiping Lucifer himself, who was once called the day star. You know, they're following into all of that idolatry because if you worship anything other than the one true and living God, the creator of it all, you're worshiping a false God. You're worshiping a, uh, in an idolatrous manner. And it became, I'll call it primeval because we're talking about the primeval time, a distortion of God's true revelation well and, and what did he reveal he revealed creation in those stars he revealed his promised redemption of the entire universe in those stars he used the constellations to teach what we know you know what we've been able to glean today so what do we know that satan does counterfeit does he ever come up with an original thought no he can't possibly so he counterfeits. So it only makes sense that here we go. God put truth in these, in the stars and the constellations. Satan's going to put lies. 
He's going to put false doctrine, false teaching, paganism, everything. And it did not only lead to astrology, but it led into spiritism. It led into all kinds of paganism, idolatry, the cult practices, demonism, all of this. Romans 1 gives us a pattern that tells us how this develops. And we see it very much all the way back to the beginning here um, with, with Babel. Romans 1, verses 18 to 25, if I don't read it all, that you'll want to. But it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. God gave the ability for every person to come to know him as God, to know him as creator and to know him as, as God. How? Well, it tells us in verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Creation shows them that, being understood through that what has been made so that they are without excuse. Remember, we've talked about this. If anyone looks at, at all creation and does not come to the conclusion that this took a master designer, then they're, they're denying the truth of the very facts of creation that it shows. It shows us there had to have been a master designer. There had to have been a God with the, the divine nature that he has to do what he has done. But they took and they went away from that. Verse 21, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. They became futile in their speculations. Ah, nope, I don't want to believe that there's a God who created and that I might have to answer to him. So their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. And I will tell you the one who says and believes in, and I, I'm saying it, I'll say it outright, evolution or anything else that takes away the credibility of our God, that takes away the fact that he's creator, are fools. The world might try to say they're wise. The world might say they've got the rocket science mind, but they are a fool when they deny God and the God of creation. And that's what the scripture calls it. So I'm only calling it out as God said it. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. They bring it down to man's level and of the birds and of the four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They brought it all the way down. And we see that, that they finally are worshiping insects and, and bugs and, and spiders and so forth. Therefore, God gave them over to the lust of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And it, it, I think we can stop right there and go back to Genesis. But we see the path down. As soon as you deny creator God, you're on a downward spiral. And the Bible calls you out as a fool. And I say, even in the heart, the fool believes that there is no God. Because you have to, you have to admit with your mind, how could this just evolve? How could it all have come together? How could it have come together at the right moment that you had all the balance needed for all of this to happen? I mean, if you start using your mind in the evolutionary teachings, you have too many questions. You have things that cannot be answered. You have jumps. You have um, just flat out, you have to accept this. This is just the way it was. It, it, it cannot be proven because it is not true. And we're going to even see, what, because they tell us that man developed very slowly. Man was caveman, you know, before man got smart. You know, we're going to see how smart man was all the way back here. We're already beginning to see it. This is early civilization. And they're able to, to take bricks, put them in a kiln. They're able to add pitch to it and make it waterproof. That's intelligence. That's looking at, at the elements around and figuring out how to make them work. We're going to see man was very bright on many levels. Um, we know that we don't have the intelligence today as some of our civilizations before. We still wonder how they did some of the accomplishments. There's the mirrors that the Egyptians had that our mirrors are not as good quality as theirs. <laughs> how can that be, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, the point being um, that 
this is just foolishness. And this is what they are doing here themselves. They're entering in now into worshiping created things rather than worshiping the one who created. And I'll prove that as we go along, I'll be saying more. They wanted to make a name for themselves. This is self-exaltation rather than worshiping God. Well, who wanted that? Do we not see that with Satan right in the beginning? And if he can get into the ungodly line, is that not what he makes them all want? Nimrod, we already saw, wanted to be a god. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted all, you know, I'm the, the shot caller and I'm the one you need to bow down to me and do it the way I want. And we'll see that all the way to the Antichrist in the end, who will have the audacity to put an image in the temple and to demand that people bow down and worship him. That's always been the, the intent of Satan, and he is still trying to get it through humankind. Yes. Didn't God punish Nimrod for that? <laughs> well, he made yeah. Grazing in the fields, was that the one? No, that's Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar raised himself up, he had seven years of living an animal like existence until he was willing to say, <laughs> there's the one true and living God. Yes. Um, but it's self exaltation rather than the worship of God. And uh, it's the, the idea really of dethroning God. Satan, we don't know how much he was able to talk with the people. We know he still talks to us today. You know, when you get a thought out of the pit of hell that Satan's the one buffeting you, Satan's the one talking to you, Satan's the one that, that's trying to turn you from the truth. You know that. So it's no long shot to think that he could have been working in Nimrod in that same way. And he could have even promised Nimrod, follow me, do it my way. I'll make you this great ruler. I'll make you sit on the throne. We'll dethrone God together. He promised that to Yeshua. He had the audacity to get in Yeshua's face. This is Matthew, Mattathiah chapter four, verses eight through 10, the temptation of Yeshua Jesus. Read that because one of the temptations that he did against Yeshua to him is he took him up on the high pinnacle, showed him the kingdoms and all, and said, just bow down and worship me and all of this will be yours. I'll put that all under you. He was telling him, you don't have to go to the cross to get the, the, the kingship. I'll give it to you. Well, why could he do that? Because Adam and Eve, when they gave up the truth, and, and followed Satan when they, they sinned, they, in essence, gave the dominion of this earth back to Satan for a time. Yeshua breaks that through his death, burial, and resurrection, and he will bring all of this world back into his kingdom, his will on earth as it is in heaven in his perfect timing. But in this meantime, Ephesians 4 tells us he is the prince of the power of the air, that there's principalities and powers of wickedness in, in high areas. That's what we're talking about. And I fully could see him getting Nimrod to believe this lie. I'll set you up like God. The same thing he's going to tell that Antichrist. I'm going to set you up like God. And what he really wants is the worship of, and that's why he literally indwells the Antichrist to receive that worship that he's been trying to get all the way back since he lost his preeminent position that he had, which was under God, but was a wonderful position. You, you've got to wonder how and why. That, that's something I never will understand. But again, verse uh, four, they're building this uh, tower, this, this city and this tower, um, Reason why, let us make a name for ourselves. They want to lift up their name. Um, otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Okay? Nimrod didn't, Nimrod didn't want them moving out like God had said. He didn't want them going out of his control. He wanted them under his leadership. He is defying God's command. And we see the ones who follow him are in revolt against God in the same way. And they are seeking to glorify themselves. They're seeking, let's make a name for ourselves. They're seeking to be worshipped in a sense also like a deity. Do we see that today? Yes. We have those that are called rock gods. We have those who are called sports gods. We have all kinds of things 
people even that are lifted up and worshiped that way. It may not be that they're bowing down to them and saying, you are my God, but in essence, you know, they're putting them up on a high pedestal, looking to them, wanting everything to be like them, to, to be with them. This is all what we're supposed to do with God. And we see it all the way back here. Now, let me tell you a little more about that tower. The tower would dominate the city. Architecturally, culturally, it was going to serve as the focal point. Later, it would be, as we see Zagrats later, it would be the political and the religious life of the population. It would be a symbol of their unity and strength. Initially, the city was not where the people dwelt. The city would have granaries that held food. It would have the temple where they would worship. It would have the ziggurat and the tower connected right with the temple. The ziggurat was not what they went into to worship, but we'll see what it is. Um, just, let me tell you just a couple more things and then I'll, I'll tell you about the ziggurat. But many of the large structures of antiquity, like the pyramids, like Stonehenge, and the Mesopotamian ziggurats that have been found, they believe many of them were copied after the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel is the first one, it's what we're seeing first, but it shows us that men did have remarkable engineering and construction capabilities. They weren't cavemen, they weren't living like Neanderthals, okay? They had brains and they were using them, and we see it. Archaeology has found much in the ruins of Babylon. They found one building that was 153 feet high. I don't know how many stories that is. I'm going to say if we say 10 feet to a story, we're looking at like maybe a 15 foot high story, high building. It had a 400 foot base. So th this was huge. This was no small building. It was constructed of dry bricks in seven stages that they said corresponded with the known planets. They knew of seven planets at that time. They made each of those bricks in some way honoring to one of those uh, planets and they dedicated them to the planets. So you see this building was a worship of the planets. Um, and on top was a tower and it had the signs of the zodiac that, that all has been found. So let me tell you a bit more about the, the ziggurat and I think, yeah, let me grab my notes on it because I don't want to forget um, Rochelle, to tell you. Yes. So if this place has, it has a name or is it just known as the Babel? It's just known as Babel. It was um, in the land of Shinar. And what did they say in the beginning? Um, just that it was a plain in the land of Shinar. So the only name given it to it is Babel. And that's the name that we'll see as we go on. We'll see that. That's the name that comes out of it. And I pulled out the wrong, <laughs> I pulled out on pitch. Did I not bring my paper? Here's my ziggurats. Okay. So like I've already told you, um, the ziggurat, the city would have a tower. The tower was called a ziggurat, um, but the city, uh, it had administration buildings. So you could have the political beginning to come in here. It had granaries and it would have this building that was connected with the temple. Now the temple um, and the ziggurat, the building with the ziggurat were usually connected. Um, I'm, I'm reading my notes so I don't forget something, but I want to not confuse you. Let, let me tell you the ziggurat itself um, had a, on the outside, it had a stairway that went all the way to the top, okay? At the top would be a little room. It would have a bed and it would have a table. And it would have on it, which I imagine must have been on the walls or the ceiling or whatever, it had the replication of the constellations, okay? Now that room, no, no, none of the, boy, I'm sorry about my English. None of the people <clears throat> in that area lived in that room. None of them even would go up and use that room. That room was for the gods. That stairway on the outside that could be seen was a stairway to make it easy for the gods to go back and forth between heaven and earth. And the room must have been for the gods' convenience. They could come in, they, I guess they'd get tired. 
they could rest. Mm -hmm. They had a table to eat on or to work at or whatever they had to do. But this was all made to make it easy for the gods to ascend back and forth. Not the people, but the gods, okay? And it was hoped that the gods would come into their temple that was connected right next to that when they were worshiping there so that the gods would be a part of their worship. They strove to make the top of their ziggurat because there's differences in them, but they strove to make the top accommodating to their God, whatever God they were worshiping. And they'd often give names to their ziggurats. They weren't names like we'd say, like Bruce or, or John or David or something like that, but they'd say that this is the temple that links, links heaven and earth. So the name of that ziggurat would be the link of heaven and earth. There was another one that said it's the temple of the stairway to the pure heaven. Now, I heard something not long ago from a source that was just speaking. It wasn't one that I could say, where did you hear that? Where did you learn that? But the comment was made that uh, we know our sun is burning out. We know that in time, our earth will be in trouble. But, oh, no worries, because by the time that happens, science will have figured out how for you to move into another realm, you'll be able to go into another existence, you'll be able to go on. So don't, don't feel bad for humanity. Don't worry for humanity. It's, it's all going to be fine. Well, I thought to myself when I studied this on the ziggurat, there's nothing new under the sun. That's what Solomon said. The same lie back then is the lie that they're giving now, that there's going to be able to be this transferring between this realm and this existing in another realm. And this time they're believing that the gods are coming down and interacting with them. And if they appease these gods, then their life is going to be good. They knew very well that they wanted to make a name, but they had to be careful what name they made. Because if they lifted themselves up and were making a name for themselves, then the gods would destroy them because the gods were the ones whose names were to be lifted up. And so they lived in fear. They had to find that balance of how to uh, make a name that would be remembered and carried on through the generations that was very important to them, but how to appease their gods at the same time. Otherwise, they knew the gods would kill them off and they'd lose that continuity, and that was that was horrible to them. Um, the 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 world of the gods is referred to as the nether world. And if you're following what some of what I'm saying, if you've studied any mythology, you see very well how mythology develops their thoughts that they took this and went with this. Um, the the top of the ziggurat would have a gate. It would be the gate of the gods. Do you remember when I told you the original name was Babalu and it meant the gate of the gods? It wasn't Babel, meaning confusion, the original name. Well, here you go. Here, the, the temple would have the stairway, the gate for the gods to move in and out from that netherworld into their world to come in and receive worship and the amenities that they would bring in for their god there. Um, <clears throat> God is never pleased with anything being worshipped in a way that it was intended for God and for God alone. But uh, this, this key then for the Tower of Babel isn't that they're building it high so that they can go up into the heavens, but it was so that the gods could come down and mix with them. And it was a worship of the heavens where their gods come from and who are their gods, the planets, the, you know, everything. So I hope that gives you a little insight to understand what was happening. This isn't God having a fit at people because they're, they're doing their own thing. This is God saying, they're so idolatrous. They are entering into such a realm of paganism, of occultism, of um, the the worship of everything but him that almost the truth could have been lost that's what we're going to see as we go on let me show you that from the scripture verse five the lord came down to see the city now if you have a bible that capitalizes your letters for lord at this time what that's pointing out is that's the word yehovah so um yehovah is the one who is coming down to 
see what's going on, so to speak. We'll talk about that word see in a moment. Yehovah was the name that God used when he was entering into a relationship with man. We saw that. Elohim created. Yehovah entered into covenant with man. Okay, so the Lord, because he's the one that's wanting that covenant with man, he came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Or if you've got the King James Version, it tells you the children, the sons of men, the children of men, the sons of Adam. Hebrew makes it very clear. It was human beings. It was the descendants of Adam. That doesn't mean it was every descendant. We know we've got godly line of Shem. We know we've got the ungodly lines that are out there. But the Lord wanted to have a covenant relationship with the humans he created. And so the Lord, with that in mind, that covenant name is telling us what's going on now. He's coming down to see what they're doing. Now, don't think for a moment that the scripture is telling us he came down to find out what was going on <laughs> because our God is all knowing. The Hebrew indicates that he was long suffering in this, that he is now stepping in officially. He's stepping in judicially, which means he's stepping in to judge. He is taking the situation under his direct eye, his direct observation. He's considered it, and now he's going to lower the boom on it. So he didn't come down to see, oh, what's going on? And how far are they getting? And, oh, no, I've got a problem. No, he's saying, I've been well aware. I know what's going <laughs> on. I have been long suffering, probably working to draw them back in different ways, and they're only getting further and further away, just like we saw Romans 1. They're getting worse and worse and worse instead of getting better and better, turning back toward God. So now he is going to judge. He is going to step in in an official manner. He's going to take the situation under his control, and he is going to meet out a judgment that is worthy of what's going on. So the Lord has come down to see, quote, what uh, this city and this tower that the men have built. Did you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. Do you think that when God separated their, their language, do you think they thought that anyone thought that one time that, no, no, we're being punished? Or yes. that this kind of went, woo. Yeah. Scary. No, I think that they're going to understand very clearly what he's doing. So let's keep going because it's right in the next couple of verses. And I think we'll answer that. Uh, verse six, the Lord said, and this is Jehovah Lord, behold, they are one people. They all have the same language. Okay, we knew that. We knew that we have an original language here. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. I thought I'd missed something, but I didn't. It's still coming. I have to remember what's still coming and what isn't. Okay. Literally, when it's saying nothing will be impossible, nothing will be restrained, nothing will be withheld, nothing will be shut off from them. They're, they're able to really accomplish a lot. Their evil was so flagrant that what was in danger of happening was that the truth of God's revelation might be completely obliterated. They were getting so far from the gospel truth in the heavens. They were so corrupting it that there was a possibility that it would be lost. The same way that we read with the Antichrist in Revelation at the very end, that the deception was so strong, if it were possible, even the believers would have been deceived. It's far worse than what we know and feel today. And believe me, what I know and feel today is plenty bad enough. It, it, the evil of this world, it's idolatry, it's paganism, it's cultic practices, all of that is sickening to me. And I'm going to say it's on steroids by the end of the tribulation. It was on steroids back here. So the forced separation of man from Babel really is going to be God's mercy, that he doesn't allow it to play itself totally out. He doesn't allow the gospel message to be lost. He doesn't allow the, the heavens to be so corrupted that the truth can't ever be seen in and through them. And so he's going to divide man linguistically with language. He's going to divide them geographically 
he basically is putting a check on their power. I'm not going to let you stay here and be a power block and corrupt so that everything is lost. Because if you've only got a smaller line of the godly and you've got a majority of the other and it continues on and it swallows up that godly line, kills them off or whatever, you would end up with nothing but the ungodly. And God in his mercy, in his justice said, no, I'm not going to let it get that far. That's what would not be impossible to man. Man could corrupt to the point of wiping out the good that is here if God did not control it. But hallelujah, we have a mighty God. He knows, he is aware, and he only lets man go so far before he pulls him up short. And in, in, in that is his mercy because by stopping it, by scattering them, by the language confusion, by them having to go out and, and rethink where they're at, hopefully they're going to come back to the truth. And especially if they saw a godly line not punished, if they saw something there, I don't know. I don't know if they saw and understood or not, but this is what God is about to do. So let's read of this judgment that God is bringing both out of um, mercy and out of uh the, out of his holiness, he cannot allow sin to corrupt completely. So he says in verse, are we ready for, yeah, seven. we're ready for seven. Come, let us go down. I just lost seven. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so they will not understand one another's speech. Okay, first you have let us go down. Who's God talking to? The father of the son Paul. <laughs> Father, Son, and we can even put in the Holy Spirit there. We've got the triunity of our God the same way. Bear sheet, Genesis 1, verse 26 said, let us make man in our image. They try to say, oh, that's the royal we. We're like, you know, royalties. We're so much that we're more than one. No, it's not a royalty. It is a fact that God the Father and God the Son do speak to each other, as Dora just said. The Spirit is right there with them, and we see that in this plurality. We're given indication in the language that our God is a triune God, that he, he is not separate gods. He's not yeah. talking to other gods. He's not talking to lesser gods. He is talking to who is his equal and who is with him. So it's the plurality of the Godhead and it's divine counsel. God speaking to God, the Father speaking with God, the Son, putting their heads together, so to speak, and going to divinely act according to their counsel, according to their mm -hmm. wisdom, according to who they are. And, and I mean, this is God's, he gets to call the shots, folks, whether you like it or not, whether you're a believer or not, he gets to, and he has the final word in the end, and we know that. Okay, so he says, let's go down, confuse, mix up, mingle. All of this is from our English, I mean, from our Hebrew, sorry. Let's confound their language. And he confounds it so that they will not understand one another's speech. The Hebrew gives the idea that they won't understand their neighbor's speech. And I think that's a little more accurate because we're going to see God didn't split up. We don't read anywhere that he split up like a husband and wife a family. It wasn't that the children suddenly couldn't understand their parents, but this family unit who's been right next to this family unit, they both have been building and worshiping and doing all this together and making this great name. And now they, they come together and they look at each other. And if I suddenly said to Roger, blah, 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 <laughs> he'd look at me and say, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, could either of us do what the other one's saying? No. Could we build something together? Not likely, not like they were doing. We have something major that stopped us that's in between us now, and that's what we're going to see. Now, it is interesting that the evolutionists cannot explain the unbridgeable gulf between the chatterings of animals. Animals are able to understand animals. We cannot understand that. We don't know why we can't bridge that is what the evolutionist says. You know, we all came out of these animals, but we can't understand their language. And it is fascinating. Do you know that even with the dolphins and the whales that they communicate, 
but the dolphins are on a higher pitched level. The whales are on a lower pitched level. So whale hears whale and dolphin hears dolphin and reacts accordingly. I mean, that's amazing. Um, yeah, the dolphins were the high ones. The animal kingdom, the ability they have to hear, go study. I don't care what, what animal you pick, if you can find a study of how they hear, and that just evolved, it will absolutely blow your mind away. The owl, and I, I forget which owl this is because it's one type. I want to call it the barnyard owl, it may be. This owl, the ears are slightly, um, they're not exactly the same. Offset, yeah. Yeah, offset, just slightly. And it gives that owl the ability in the dark to be able to, to pinpoint exactly where that sound came from to find their prey. They're able to do the depth and, and all of this out of the, the ears just being slightly off. So it enables them to get the food they need to survive. Now, evolution says, oh, well, that's why the ears grew because they had that need. Well, then how did the owl survive until those ears grew off? And why does the baby come out born that way? Why doesn't it have to develop that? You know, it, it, I could go on and on and on. I mean, the more you study, the more evolution is just a, it's, it, it'd be laughable if it wasn't so sad. It really would. And I'll tell you again that I don't believe I learned of the ears through the book, but I love the book, If Animals Could Talk by Gist, G-U-I-E-S-T. -E I should have thought I'd be bringing this out. I'll show you the book next week. Um, text me or, or ask me if you want it before then. Get it by its title, If Animals Could Talk. It's about a $10 paperback through like Amazon or whatever. It's not an expensive book. It's written for children to be able to understand, but it will fascinate and blow away the mind of any adult right along with the child. I love the book. I probably should have taken out stock in their, in their um, offers because I've given away so many of the books. You know, um, like you're all at evolution, there is nothing to prove. They have no proof that evolution existed and happened. Not because at all. Every time they try it, they make something to make it look like something happened. Then you find out it wasn't real. Right. It, it just it always falls apart. And the difference between animal language and human language mm -hmm. is why the evolutionist says that we don't have an answer for that. How the human developed the language as developed as it is, but as foreign to the animals, and the animals is foreign to them. They they cannot, but we know God created man with ability to speak and to hear. Adam didn't have to be taught how to speak, he wasn't a baby. He didn't babble. It's before babble, but he didn't babble. And uh, he was able to communicate with God. Man knows God through his word. Who's his word? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Man knows God through his word. Man knows God through the son. And if you can see that, you know, evolution's just a hogwash can't think of another word <laughs> but should have been, okay now when man used his gift of language that god had given him to communicate with god himself as well as with his fellow man when he's using that language in rebellion against his maker then it's only appropriate that that's where god meted down the judgment they were using their language ability to rebel against God. So God hit them in their language ability. So yes, I do think if they were willing to recognize that it was God's hand and not just say, well, we don't know how this happened. It just happened and it didn't, da, 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 and they just go on. But if they were willing to see this was a judgment from God. And since they're trying to appease all the gods, why would they not realize this God, they did not appease. And he did judge them in the very thing that was displeasing to him. So he judged them in their language and he forced them now to separate from each other so that they would go out and fill the face of the earth like they were supposed to. Modern linguists, those who, who study all of this in a depth that I cannot, I don't have that kind of ability, but they said that they know man did not invent language. I find this very interesting. They say man couldn't invent language any more than he could invent his circulatory system or his nervous system. There's no way that they believe that the language is so unique that the only way they can explain it apart from God 
is to say it had an evolutionary process. Well, then where did the gap ever get connected and why can we not connect to the animal world today? It just, again, evolution falls apart. Language cannot be the product of man putting together sounds all by himself. And the example that my book gave that I was studying to understand this, and you'll love this, forgive me, but everybody knows there's one common sound that permeates through languages. <laughs> the raspberry, as we call it, okay? We all understand that. That's sound. If language was built on sound, then that, I can't even do it now. So the raspberry sound would have become part of the language because that's all man would have had to work with, with sound. And it would have built from sounds and built it into a language. But it's not. It, even though we can communicate with it, it still yeah. did not make a language. It didn't become a word. It's just a sound. How did we get words? How do we get language so complex that the language is a whole system? It's, it's all the small put together. When we teach children to read, we have to teach them a whole system to get them to be able to read. It's not just sounds. So most modern linguists believe that all languages started, are you ready for it? From one language. Well, what did the Bible tell us? There was an original language and then it was confounded and we have languages from thereafter. So here they go. They prove the Bible, whether they want to agree with it or not. But yes, in answer to your question earlier, I do believe that God judged specifically and they should have been able to see and understand the same way that you would punish a child with a punishment that fits that crime. You know, if they do something, they they stole the cookie they weren't supposed to eat, then they don't get dessert that day. You know, something that relates. So I believe God was trying to relate to them and reveal to them. He gave them that ability to speak. You remember Daffy Duck Town, he talks. No, I can't do it, but yes. Yeah, all the time. That's about the rapper was out of your making a language all the way up. Right, but it's still. It will change. <laughs> you still you use words. Yeah. Every language uses words. And that's what we're saying. It's not built on sounds. It's not sounds. It's not sounds became words. No, sounds are still sounds. Yeah. Words are words. So if you're having trouble wrapping your brain about it, that's fine. That's because God's greater than you and me. <laughs> okay, so the Lord scattered them abroad. Verse 8 tells us that he's going to accomplish his purposes. Remember, chapter 9, verse 1 said, go out, scatter yourselves. So he accomplishes his goal in spite of man's disobedience. The city is never finished. And the tower, even though the tower was apparently completed, it's the tower leading to nowhere. It's, it's doing nothing. Okay. Now, um, there's a, a creation research in San Diego. Many of you are familiar with this works. Henry Morris, creationist scientist. He's the director of the Institute. And I'm, I want to tell you what he brought out that I found very interesting because we have the people go out because they can't understand each other. And we know that they develop nations because chapter 10's already told us that. But how do we get the fact that the Japanese all are olive skin, dark hair, slanted eyes? How do we get um, who else can I say that that looks very different than that? Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of races that that you know you look at them and you kind of can know what race they are. Um, oh goodness, give me another example, somebody. Um, that I'm, all I think of, I'm, I'm my mind. Let me just tell it to you, and then you India. Can, thank you, thank you. There, very much. We've got. Um, one of my one of my prayer conferences that speaks with a very heavy Indian accent. I have to hold on for dear life to understand his words. I pretty much have to hear a sentence and then piece it together. And they, they're more red colored in their skin. And you know there are these differences, are major differences when we look at ethnic differences in people. And I am not picking on anyone and calling anything better or less than God loves variety. 
Okay, God put all the variety into the gene pool. What, what Henry Moore said was that as each family unit migrated away from Babel, they developed a distinctive culture. We all do that. We have the culture that's passed down to us. And we know that if you've got a lot of grandparents and other influences in your family, you've got a lot of mix of culture. Israel is, is called a melting pot because they have that. And we even had one talking recently to us telling us about how the, the different cultures were out there and the parents wanted the, the children to marry within their culture, not into another culture. So this is what we're talking about. But these cultures, these distinctive cultures that they took out, starting with their language, being very distinctive. So in my opinion, the Korean language, the Filipino language, the, um, Vietnamese. the Vietnamese language, the, you know, all the different languages we have, this is the starts of all those languages. But we see more than that, we see distinctive physical and biological characteristics. Because as I'm saying, if you take a Japanese mama and a Japanese papa, I can guarantee you their baby is not going to be blonde hair, blue eyed, white skinned. You know, they're going to look like mom and dad. So how do we get that? Well, as the peoples went out, they, they had to have intermarriage going on because they couldn't communicate with other families. They couldn't communicate with the other, I'll call them tribal units they would be staying within themselves and they would intermarry within themselves. And it is a well-established genetic fact that variations take place very quickly in a small inbreeding population. If you've got a big population, it's very slow. And that, that only makes sense. If, if it's small, the, the, the genes there, the recessant genes, the dominant genes show up very quickly. If there's a lot to choose from, there'd be less of the changes. So as they inbred within their areas, these genes came up very quickly that became more and more dominant so that as time moved down, the Koreans look like Koreans, the black people look like black people, the Indians look like Indians. The Anglos look like Anglos, okay? That thought that each came from a different line, that Ham's line was cursed, and I'll say it again because it's out there as, as a teaching and it's out of the pit of hell, that the Black people came from Ham and so they're cursed and that's why they're Black. Throw that out and don't ever, ever, you know, say that or treat someone like that. No, God made all of the varieties. He put them all into the gene pools. Yes, out of the three sons came all of these distinctives, but I don't think they looked very different. I think as time moved on through this inbreeding that Henry Morris is explaining, it came to be that way. That That's what took some time. Um, uh, again, the, the distinctive characteristics of skin, of color, of height, hair texture, facial features, and somewhat even the temperaments um, we're seeing within particular tribes and particular nations. Because you will say, you know, a people are known for this or they're known for that. So it, it very well could be that this is how it developed since the Earth's population was very young. Since um, before the flood, you had very little environmental radiation. You didn't have genetic mutations. That's why they lived the long lives that they did. And after the flood, why the lives were much, much shorter. So without that, the mutation, the, the danger of congenital defects that we deal with today weren't there originally. By the time we get to um, God giving instruction to the children of Israel going into the promised land, they were taught not to marry within family. That was called insensuous marriage. It was illegal. That's Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 to 14 and verse 18. Uh, a son wasn't to marry his wife. The brother and sisters weren't to marry. So it's very soon that they do have to move further apart so that you don't have the genital, the, am I saying that right? The gene defects. But originally, there wouldn't have been. God kept them in such a way. You didn't have these things happening to it. So the process of migration, cultural development, 
it didn't require long ages. This popped up very quickly. It's not that it took thousands of years for the, the children to look like their parents. That started happening rapidly. And rather than um, it, it being generation after generation, you would have had mixed and you would have had view of that. We would know of that but it, it would have happened very quickly. And it's interesting that archeology span has also confirmed that civilization appeared more or less contemporaneous, contemporaneously with the rest of the world. In other words, when civilization found a footing in India, it found a footing in Japan. When it found a footing in those countries, it found a footing in the Icelandic countries or in um, the, what well, we know in the Fertile Crescent where it started, so I gotta go figure out. But you don't find that, well, this part of the world developed, the African continent, let's say, developed at a different time than South America. And that South America developed at a different time than, than Northern Russia and those areas, no. Archeology span shows it's very, very much along about the same time and they themselves say it only happened maybe a few thousand years ago. They don't give room for the evolutionary process that evolution wants to say. It took all this time and they had to go through all those different stages before you got down to man knowing how to invent the wheel, so to speak. Um, as a tribal family would migrate, they look for a suitable location to live. They needed water. So very often we see civilization start where there was a river or a spring, where there was a, a fertile plain, because that would be food for them. So they had food and water, they had what they needed. And then they were able, because we see they were, they had intelligence. They were able to use their intelligence. They developed agriculturally. They found what grew well in their area, but they developed outside of that also. They developed in the area of ceramics and metallurgy, working with metals. They discovered mines and they were able to bring the metal out of the mines and use them. They used the clay like we saw with, you know, to make the bricks. They had other pottery. They learned how to breed animals for um, work and for planting crops, you know, all of this simultaneously was developing. God gave man a great brain and he was able to do this. In the meantime, until he developed to the degree that we have of this day and age, all of them would have survived by hunting, by fishing, by gathering fruits and nuts. They had temporary homes that we have found built out of stone, out of lumber, and we saw homes in caves, depending on where they were living, what was available, what they were able to do. Um, but again, to say that there had to be a Stone Age culture, well, then why do we find ceramics and metals at the same time? If there, you know, we, we call it the Bronze Age or the Iron Age, and we know that man developed using with those, but why are they very close in time? It's because it was all developing in that time. And as the population increased, suitable building materials were developed. Then you begin to have cities, you begin to have the villages and you have quickly what we call today urbanization, the, you know, the living urbanized lives. This is what God had intended was them to go out and fill the face of the earth. That means he made the earth inhabitable. He didn't intend for them to live just in the plain of Shinar. And we see all the development. So if you've ever wondered, well, how did we get a Japanese person. We know we got the juice through this line, but how did that differentiate from a, a Filipina, a Korean, a, a Swedish, a Norwegian? You know, well, this is how we see the development and we see it prove the Bible rather than disprove and say, oh, evolution did this and they're darker skin because they live closer to the sun and they had to have a darker skin to not get sunburned. Well, hello. <laughs> then again, why do the babies come out that way? I heard years ago in a science program for kids that the giraffe has a long neck because the food was just out of reach. So the giraffe had to stretch their neck to get those leaves to survive. And they kept stretching their neck and stretching their neck. And I thought to myself, I was, I was very young at the time, but I thought, 
then why doesn't anybody who stretches their neck grow a longer neck? And why does the baby giraffe come out with a very long neck already? It just doesn't fit. God's word is true. So the verse, um, I think we're ready for nine. They stopped building the city. They scattered. They're filling the whole face of the earth. God's will be done. Don't ever come against God's will and think you're going to win. <laughs> you just never will. Verse nine. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Here again is proof that it's being written in the Hebrew because that tells us confusion and God brought confusion versus it being called Babalu, the gate to the gods. Because remember, that was the name that Nimrod was giving his, his city was, was Babalu. But Babel, out of the Hebrew, meaning confusion, Babel, it, it all fits that Babylon, um, which is in this area, became known as the city of babbling, the city of confusion. Um, by the way, if you want where it was called the gate of God, that was chapter 10 and verse 10, as I told you before. Um, it was a tower to bring them to worship God, but they were worshiping the false God. It was false worship. So rather than bringing together, they have confusion, they have babbling, they can't even worship together because how would you like to go in and try to worship with somebody in a language you did not understand? You'd wonder, well, who am I worshiping? Who am I honoring if you don't know what page they're on? So we have the judgment of the third dispensation, human government that God gave to them. Uh, we saw Noah setting up human government. We see it fails miserably because under human government, they decide to come all together make a name for themselves, make a tower to bring the gods into their world and to worship the created rather than the creator. So God judges it, confuses their language, and spreads them out as he had commanded. And Babel became the name to stand for what is in opposition to God. The way we all look at it and we all know that. And it's very interesting when I repeat that for you, it's, the, it's the, the word used to stand for what is in opposition to God. Now, when you get to the children of Israel entering the promised land, the first time in, they have great victory. It's called Jericho. The walls of Jericho come tumbling down. The very next battle, if they go into it, Ai, they have a horrible defeat. The defeat was because of Achan's sin. Achan had taken and hid for himself treasures rather than destroying and not taking anything as God had told them. And it's interesting, he took gold and he took a Babylonian garment. That's what he took from the spoils of, of battle and hid them in his tent and it brought God's judgment on the children of Israel at that time. Goes all the way back to Babylon. Babylon, the opposition to God. Now, it's also something more comes out of Babylon, and I want to bring that to your attention because we start with it in Genesis. We see its finish in Revelation. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you know, chapter 17 and 18 talk about the destruction of Babylon. It talks about the religious and the commercial and political in the, the different chapters, and we see a total destruction. Babylon is given by the word of God a complete, never to be rebuilt destruction that has not yet been seen. Even um, as recent as, as um, is it Saddam Hussein that was building Babylon? Yeah, it was Saddam Hussein. Even as recently as his time, he built palaces, he was building it up. He wanted it to be a wonder of the world like in Nebuchadnezzar's day. So you don't have yet that total never to be rebuilt, that it would be just a wasteland forever that is coming. But what happened between Bereshit Genesis and Revelation? Because I see a tie that goes all the way through time, through all of our Bible time, through all of our present time, and all the way to the tribulation time when it's finally destroyed. Nimrod had a wife. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name right, but I'm going to say Samirimus, okay? It's my way of pronouncing it. Um, Samir Samirimus, reputedly originated what was called the Babylonian mystery religion, and she was the first high priestess. 
Now, according to even ancient lore, uh, well, I shouldn't say even because this is not biblical. According to ancient lore, she outlived Nimrod by 42 years. She gave birth to a son after Nimrod died and claimed that he was miraculously conceived and named him Tammuz. He was hailed, Tammuz was hailed as a savior of his people. And it was purported that he was the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Now, what do we see? Do you see Satan's conspiracy against God taking what God promised, the first messianic promise, Genesis 3.15, when sin entered into mankind, God promised the Redeemer. And he promised him, as we know through the scripture, a miraculous virgin birth. He would be the savior. He would have, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's even more coming, okay? But notice the counterfeit. And that's all Satan can do is counterfeit. So his conspiracy against God, he, I think, revealed or, or used Nimrod and Samirmus. I think he was the one behind developing this mystery religion with this high priestess. She became, I'm talking Samirmus, she became worshipped as the queen of heaven. We read about the queen of heaven in Yermia, Jeremiah, chapter 7 and verse 18. And we read about it also in Jeremiah 44, verses 16 to 26. Let me read it to you. Oh, my word. I just saw the clock. <laughs> I had no idea. We are past time. And this will take a little bit of time to do. So you know what? I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you that we're going to look at Mystery Babylon. You can draw your conclusion of what you believe that it has become. But I think you're going to see something very clearly. I'm only going to give it to you in short form. If you want it in longer form, get into my study in the book of Revelation where we went into it in detail. But I do have to call a halt because I can't do this in a couple of minutes. So I will bring us back to Mystery Babylon. I'll bring us back to Nimrod, to his wife, Samirmas to what she claimed, who she gets called. I'll show you how it relates, how it, it differentiates from scripture. Um, and we will take it and we will tie it from Nimrod to the Antichrist before I'm done. Okay? So I hope that interests you for next week. I hope it makes you want to come back. Um, for those who needed to go on time, my apologies. I'm going to close in a quick word of prayer. We will open it up for questions, comments for any who can stay. But I had no idea that uh, we've come so far over. So <laughs> my apologies. Lord God, thank you for giving us your word, for giving us the truth, for, for giving us a world that the truth cannot swallow it up, that the truth will prevail, that it is seen, that we can know the truth, and that it has set us free because you are the way the truth, and the life. So we honor you, Yeshua Jesus. We honor you, Yehovah, our Abba, our Father in heaven. We honor you in, in our faith, believing you to be the one true and living God who has made relationship with you possible through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. We thank you and we praise you and we pray that we will be lights in this darkness, that we will be able to call out the faults and the counterfeit because we have studied the truth. We know the truth, and Lord, may we use that not as a weapon, but as a mode of love to bring your love to a world that needs to know that God so loved that he gave his only son. Use us, Lord. May we have many more that come to saving faith because you've been able to use mere flesh with your spirit in us to accomplish your will. And we praise you and we thank you. Your will is never thwarted. It always is victorious. In your holy name, with praise and thanksgiving, we say, Amen. 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 Wow, where did our class time go? <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments. I was on a roll and I keep going. <laughs>